Mr. Chair, council members and participants, we are now live. Good morning, everyone. This is a public hearing on the Committee of Public Safety regarding resolution number 220884. And before we begin, I'd like to recognize Anthony Glass to read the required announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand the state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for the questions or commentary they have for the witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glass. And now, can we uh, call a roll to establish a quorum? And will members in attendance please say a few words so that your image can be captured on TV? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Council Member Gaudier. Good morning, Mr. Chair, present. Good morning. Council Member Gim. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I am present. Good morning. Council Member Brooks. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I'm present. Good morning, Member Brooks. Council Member Thomas. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Vice Chairman Johnson. And Chairman Jones. I am present. We have established a quorum. Uh, and so would you now please read the title of the resolution that we are hearing today? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Resolution number 220884, authorizing the City Council Committee on Public Safety to hold a public hearing examining the true cost of crime on Philadelphia residents. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say a few words uh, before we get started. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that there was a article that I wrote a long time ago before I was elected. And it talked about a young person who um, stole a car. And that individual stole a car and we began a exercise to chronicle everyone that was impacted by that crime from the person whose car that was stolen that may have lost a day of work to the individual that arrested the uh, offender and how much they got paid and the uniform that they bought and the equipment from the gun to the bullets to the handcuffs that were purchased to the person that the turnkey that actually put them into a cell to the public defender that was assigned to that individual to the people that actually contracted with the jail or prison that housed the individual, the people that sold the uh, food that the uh, incarcerated individual ate, to the defense attorney, to the prosecutor, to the judge, to the stenographer, to the people that sat on the jury and what they were paid. And we went through a long litany of the economics of crime uh, and its impact. That was the first kind of uh, incentive for this hearing. Second one was uh, Reverend Holstein brought me to a block in my district. And I'll never forget how he showed that that block cost all of us a million dollars a year. I'm going to say it again, $1 million a year because of people that might have been incarcerated on probation, on parole, people who were victimized by the crime that lost 
time from work and the true cost of crime that we all pay for and we need to monitor. Why? Not so that we can do more punishment, but that we can understand what it costs us not to solve this problem. What it costs us if we don't invest early. I want, want a, another person showed that I think back then the tuition for college tuition at the time at community college was somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to thirteen thousand dollars a year versus the cost of incarceration, which at that time was somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty thousand dollars a year. So I've I've uh, often said in many different hearings and some almost to nauseum from some of my members that if it ain't measured, it ain't managed. And I went to public school. I know that's broken English, but it makes the point that if we don't look at the cost of crime in its many different aspects, then we cannot begin to manage our budgets effectively to make the proper investments early on that can, in the long run, save us money. To be a penny wise and a pound foolish is not the way that we should go. We understand that we can't arrest our way out of these problems, but we can invest our way into some of the solutions that these problems are causing. So what we want to do is take a hard look at the cost centers around criminal activity and what it does to our society. Just simply, one third of our budget, I'm going to say this, one third of our budget is spent on public safety. Police, fire, of course, prisons, courts, represents one third of every dollar that we pay in taxes. We expend on public safety or the attempt to make our community safer. So we want to take a look at this so that we can better appropriate, so that we can better invest, so that we can better understand what the true cost of crime is to Philadelphia and its citizens. And with that, Mr. Uh, are there any other members on the Public Safety Committee who would like to uh, make comments at this time? Seeing none, Mr. Glass, would you please read the names of the first panel to testify? Mr. Chairman, the first panel will be Erica Atwood. Ms. Atwood, how are you? Good morning, Council Member. Uh, good, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Atwood, a Deputy and Managing Director's Office and Senior Director for the Office of Policy and Strategic Initiatives for Criminal Justice and Public Safety. Um, and before I begin uh, my my formal testimony, um, thank you, Council Member Jones, for um, one giving me this opportunity to speak on gun violence in Philadelphia. Um, the work of the cluster that I manage, the cost of gun violence in our city to the individual, but also our communities as a whole. Uh, CJP, CJPS is the City of Philadelphia's coordinating agency for five individual departments that make up the city's non-law enforcement response to gun violence. Our agency includes the Office of Violence Prevention, the Office of the Victim Advocate, the Office of Criminal Justice, the Office of Reentry Partnerships, and Town Watch Integrate, Integrated Services. Uh, prior to my role as senior director, I served the city of Philadelphia in developing the city's roadmap to safer communities, our public health approach to reducing gun violence, and incubating safe, healthy, and hopeful, uh, safe, healthy, and hopeful Philadelphia. The roadmap is our comprehensive plan to establish and implement a gun violence prevention strategy that will reduce the rising 
gun violence rates. The strategy is focused on four central pillars that inform all of our approaches to gun violence in the city. Connected and thriving youth, young adults, and families, coordinated city services and planning, strong community engagement and partnerships, and safe and healthier neighborhoods. Our office strives to meet the pillars of the roadmap by providing social services to communities impacted by gun violence, advocating for changes in policy that result in better outcomes for our communities, and coordinating siloed resources to produce better opportunities, and I will add outcomes for all Philadelphians. Our programs include outreach services for individuals at the most risk of committing or being exposed to gun violence, interventions for services for young people already involved in the cycle of violence, reentry services for individuals returning from incar the incarceration system, and time watch training for community members interested in becoming more involved in their own neighborhood safety. As someone who stands at the helm of this work, I'm embedded in all elements of the gun violence continuum, from the upstream preventative work to the downstream work focused on intervention, which brings me uh, to the second purpose of today's hearing. Every day, our office is faced with the cost of gun violence to individuals, communities, and Philadelphia as a whole. As of today, approximately 1,600 individuals have been a shot in Philadelphia this year, and over 450 have lost their lives to gun violence in 2020, 2022. This means hundreds of families uh, going to sleep every night without a member um, or sometimes members of their family. The cost of gun violence to our communities is infinitely complex and nearly immeasurable, but I'm going to try to paint a picture for you. First, I'd like to note that Philadelphia has the third largest high, uh, third highest poverty rate in the nation. Gun violence is a symptom of this poverty. When people, especially young people, whose emotional and mental states are still developing, are faced with life or death challenges of extreme poverty, it stands to reason that they may react irrationally or even violently. On an individual family level, when a Philadelphian becomes a victim of gun violence or loses a member to gun violence, they can also face financial difficulties that hamstring a family. Some of these challenges face, uh, some of the challenges facing survivors of gun violence include, um, first and foremost, a death is immeasurable and, and, and irreplaceable loss. Individuals who lose someone to violence are faced with the reality of trauma, of never being able to see that person again. This trauma can lead to mental health challenges and possibly and the possibility of self-harm or harm to others. Hospital visits are costly in the United States and an emergency room visit for gun violence incident is no different. In 2022, Philadelphians have been charged over uh, roughly 267.4 million in hospital fees to date. Say that, oh, I'm sorry, yes, say that figure again. Sure. In Philadelphia, right. In 2022, Philadelphians have been charged $267.4 million in hospital fees to date. Furthermore, families that lose someone to gun violence often have to relocate or become dependent upon assistance to cover potential financial losses, financial losses as um, such as long-term disability, limitations on mobility, child care for replacing a missing spouse, um, or parent transportation and emotional support. These individual challenges trickle up to the community in the following ways. Communities lose a sense of cohesion and safety um, due to a new or increased sense of danger. Neighborhoods often experience increased mental wellness challenges as, a sen as their sense of physical um, insecurity increases due to violent incidents in their neighborhood. Property value decreases in neighborhoods more vulnerable to gun violence, increasing poverty, financial um, vulnerability, and leading to future incidents of violence. Communities face generational trauma due to years of violence throughout many levels in the family. But gun violence doesn't stay local. It radiates outwards uh, to, to a greater societal level. Gun violence is an issue that disproportionately impacts communities of color and is therefore an issue of racial justice. Non-Hispanic Black Philadelphians and Hispanic Philadelphians generally make up over 90% of the shooting victims in our city. Our communities are under siege. One of my greatest challenges in this role is reaching media about the work of our office. Too often media reports on violence occurring in community, but it rarely covers the resources available to victims of gun violence. 
As you can imagine, media reporting solely focuses on violent incidents, but doesn't provide solutions or options for safety, only increases the danger in our neighborhoods and heightens the negative impacts of gun violence I've already mentioned. Despite all of these challenges, the criminal justice and public safety cluster continues to work tirelessly on the issue of gun violence. This coming year, we're finally poised to launch a ready program, a pilot modeled after a successful violence prevention program in Chicago. Ready provides professional services, mental health supports, and transitional supports to individuals, <coughs> excuse me, who have experienced or are at risk of committing violence, but also very resistant to services. I am I am excited for this next step in our fight against this epidemic of violence and look forward to reporting out on it in the future. I want to enclose, uh, close by highlighting something that I say often in this work. Um, there's no cure for all, uh, there's no cure off for gun violence. This problem will not go away overnight. Uh, to address gun violence in Philadelphia, we have to take all of our resources, pers um, persistence and patience. We have to provide societal uh, social services that get to the heart of the problem, poverty and the challenges that come from facing financial hardship. This is the highest priority for my cluster um, and why we developed the Roadmap to Safer Communities and the Kenny Administration. In order for us to do the vital work of meeting our communities most vulnerable to gun violence where they are and providing them with uh, the best services possible, we need to continue the support of all branches of our government. I hope to continue to receive your support and collaboration in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to speaking to, for speaking today, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. It's so much to unwrap in what you what you presented. Yes, One of the things that jumped out at me was the actual medical cost, um, and and it's a staggering figure uh, in, in two hundred million plus that that people are charged with, and someone at the end of the day has to pay that bill. And, and so that's number one. The other thing that I remember in other testimonies, you, you, when, when we do this work, we hear things from different sectors. And one of the things that I remember that um, is a cost, someone said, and I quote, and I'm paraphrasing, that when a black man goes to jail, a black woman wind up in the shelter. And what did that mean to me was that when someone is incarcerated, they may have been um, a contributor to the rent, they've been a contributor to the household. Sometimes, you know, you know, it, it wasn't a regular nine to five job, but it was still a contribution uh, to the maintenance of that household. And when that income is lost due to incarceration, that rent still is due. And that cost. Uh, doesn't get uh, absorbed somewhere else. And that was a pathway um, to poverty for many uh, single parents with dependent children. I, I remember. So as we start to unfurl this, there are costs, direct costs and indirect costs right. yes. that we don't quantify in a way to know the true cost. And that's the purpose uh, of this hearing. Um, as we start to look, and, and I, I want to thank you publicly. Uh, for the work you do. It is not the kind of work where you get awards. You're not going to, this, this is the, this is the nitty gritty boots on the ground work, literally boots on the ground work that will not necessarily offer all the answers, but it will damn sure give us more of the questions. And, and that is as important. Um, I guess one of the other things um, that you talked about, I, I don't know if we've ever taken a hard look at uh, the victims and what their costs are when they miss work. And uh, do, do you have in your, in your work, have you ever found any of those figures? Um, we haven't, but we're because the, um, with the establishment of the Office of the Victim Advocate, we are able to now really focus on them. And the one thing I will say um, that we are um, that I have been 
um, really trying to needle in on is um, often when we talk about or when we when we meet with survivors, we often meet with the co-victims. We also we often meet with the mothers, the relatives. But there is a whole um, demographic of individuals. There are thousands of individuals in the city um, that have survived being shot that we don't often hear from. They are young black and predominantly young black men. Uh, the figure is one in seven are living with some sort of um, irreparable injury. And so a paralysis, a colonoscopy bag or something that has changed their lives um, permanently. And, and we really need to calculate that cost um, when it comes to what is happening in our um, nursing homes um, and how they are being populated by young black men. Um, when we talk about um, mothers who should be looking to retirement, but they're giving care to their adult children um, because they can't take care of themselves because of uh, victims uh, because they've been a shooting victim. And so those are the voices and those are the costs, um, measurable and otherwise that we want to begin to to lift up so we can address it. The English house in my district is one of those facilities where people who have been uh, paralyzed due to gun violence wind up. And we, we need to start. And one of the things that I want the controller's office in the future to do is to start to look at a model that truly creates a matrix that has the columns and lines to truly calculate what the impact of that pebble in the middle of the pond rippling out actually does to society. Um, and, and one of them is, as you mentioned, the cost of um, disabling an individual from working uh, full time. Another one of those costs uh, is when people actually, and I'm looking at the victim side, and I'm looking at the um, a perpetrator and or accused side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of them are different columns, but they all wind up in the same bottom line of what it costs society. And I want us to start to look at measuring these things that way. Um, and, and, and one of them is that when there, and I want it, as I go through this hearing, I think of more cost centers what a colloquy when someone takes a plea bargain, mm -hmm. there's over 200 things in the, in the, the judge usually says, and uh, Samantha Williams helps me with this. There are like 200 different things that when you plead guilty, you can no longer do once you have pleaded guilty to a felony. Yes. And some of them, uh, Wayne, uh, what's his name? Wayne, he's going to kill me. Uh, anyway, Wayne in North Philly, Wayne, um, always tells me that people, when they come out, even after they serve their time, cannot practice whatever craft licensed, uh, you know, uh, uh, skill that they do because of those kinds of uh, limitations. And that has a cost. So if I was a doctor and I got in trouble for you know, a, a violent act, let's say, you know, I got into it with, you know, uh, an irate patient, I can never be a, I, ne I can never practice medicine again. And so those kinds of things have a cost as well. So I'm going to stop and ask any of um, my fellow um, committee members, if they have questions for this witness. Mr. Glass, do I? Mr. Chairman, it does not appear that any members have any questions at, the t at this time. I so I'm going to thank you, Ms. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes. I have a question in the Number chat. Two. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Ms. Atwood. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony and um, deeply appreciate uh, the work that the city is um, doing. Um, you know, I think one of our big investments uh, for the city has been around the community crisis intervention program. Yeah. And as you know, recently the evaluation that was conducted um, on CCIP 
laid out a number of concerning issues with the program, um, including difficulty around uh, coordination, a lack of support staff, uh, little involvement with community stakeholders, and the lack of clear measurable goals for the program, uh, mm -hmm. other than the general goal of reducing violence. Can you talk a little bit about how your office is addressing the concerns laid out in the evaluation, and specifically whether uh, your office is developing clear measurable goals right now, what they entail, and how you actually will measure them? Sure. Um, thank you for that question, Council Member uh, Gim. And so with regard to our community crisis intervention program, um, it was established in 2018 as a violence interrupter program. Um, what we have done in response to um, the evaluation, actually, let me back up a little bit and I'll say this. Um, while what we received from the process evaluation was not necessarily a um, a gold star. Uh, what we do realize is that it gets us on the right track. And so uh, I was asked by a reporter, is it a gut punch? No, it's not a gut punch. It gets us on the right track. We have a corrective action plan now. And in that corrective action plan is we are hiring a director internal to the city that will work with, um, will not just rely on the contractor to be um, chiefly in charge of facilitating the program, but we will have stronger um, oversight at that program, um, and that uh, position actually should be um, posted within the next uh, three to four weeks. Um, with the hiring of that position, um, we will now be able to coordinate now our three providers for this program because we can develop shared outcomes and have a benchmark of measuring um, now that we, are, we have democratized the work and hired um, um, providers that specialize. And so we have, we've always had uh, Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network PAN. So now we also have Eddie's House in West and Southwest Philadelphia. <clears throat> and we additionally added IDEI. Um, and so IDEI is really going to focus on juveniles. And so as we were seeing that uptick, how are we specializing our supports and services for that? How are we utilizing a different geographic approach because of the, the, the nuances and personalities of our neighborhood? And that how are we um, across our providers, strengthening our training program, um, really implementing a program for professional development for the outreach workers, building out partnerships with um, organizations um, like um, uh, our trauma one centers across the city and um, community, uh, community college of Philadelphia to be able to support these um, these violence interrupters. Additionally, we are going to continue to work with our evaluator to um, really adjust um, uh, what the impact is uh, for our community crisis intervention program. So helping um, getting that support and developing those benchmarks um, from a national expertise, from the national expert, being informed by um, local experts uh, and continue to um, align our interrupter program um, with others that exist, um, not just locally, but nationally um, and having, um, uh, we have already set a table um, with our other interrupter models and Dr. Ruth Abaya has set that table um, where we are coming together. Um, uh, so you have Temple at the table, you have Presbyterian at the table, you have the city of Philadelphia at the table and others who have violence interrupter programs and how are we developing not just shared out outcomes for the city, but shared outcomes for all communities that have violence interrupted work happening. Does that get at your, your, your question? Yeah, I think this is going to be an ongoing, you know, Absolutely. conversation to hold um, our investments to the standards that I think we need um, to do, but also most importantly to meet the needs of communities. Um, another key issue that was raised in the report was the difficulty of staff to quickly provide resources to people they meet who need them. Um, we know that this has long been a problem around um, access to mental health services, employment, other types of things. So. Could you talk a little bit about what is being done to coordinate the timely delivery of resources? Um, sure. I, yeah, um, sorry. Um, sure. That much of the city's role is about referrals and people cannot make the connection between multiple referrals to multiple different places and to actually getting those resources delivered to them. 
Yeah, so part of that um, is strengthening our um, our case management and our coordination services. The other nuance that I was saying, this is not an excuse, but just a, a highlight, this evaluation was happening in the midst of COVID. And so the connections with providers were not there in the way that they they are now. And so we are re-strengthening those relationships we had with behavioral health supports, we had with um, employers, um, including um, those that we have contacts contracts with, with our group violence intervention program to ensure we are making that through line and connection. We are, we are um, uh, strengthening our opportunities to document and track how we are connecting individuals. And so um, innovating the app that we use, ensuring that all of our um, our, our street outreach workers are, are trained and fully comfortable with that, ensuring that they are trained on other things in terms of de-escalation, um, mediation. It's also ensuring that we're actually hiring the right people. Just because you're from the hood doesn't mean you can do this work. And so we have to make sure that we are having the conversations and really elevating um, the benchmarks by which we hire folks to do this work. Yeah. Um, you know, during COVID, we created the most successful um, rent assistance eviction prevention program um, that the city, you know, that the country had seen. Um, during COVID, we were able to deliver mutual aid, figure things out. I mean, I, I know that that was a challenging time, but as com crisis is about meeting it um, and then trying to figure out how to uh, make sure that we're not fitting individuals into something that we create, but adapting our systems to meet the needs. So I know that that's gonna continue to go on. Um, before the phase two evaluation does come out, however, I understand that there will be a phase two. Mm -hmm. uh, what changes are you making to the program based on the, on the issues that are raised in phase one and which ones are you prioritizing? Um, we're prioritizing hiring a director um, and, and training and professional development of um, uh, the, uh, of the current workers and increasing um, the capacity of the program across the city. Those are the things that we know um, we've we've got to we've got to take the training a lot more seriously. And I've I've expressed that and I've communicated that to my team and the providers. Um, and having someone who is that their full time job is to manage this program, I think, is really critical. Um, and to making sure that we have the most appropriate oversight and we are ensuring that our investments are going where they need to go okay um and then and we have a full report of uh of how we are going to respond to each of the points that we've put out with um when we did announce the um the evaluation about a month ago okay i just need to emphasize that hiring the executive director cannot be a priority for phase two evaluation it just can't it is like basically a responsibility it's it's a it is the job my questions were really about the core questions identified with the evaluation. We are not coordinated. We do not have enough support for staff that doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily the result of the executive director. I, it's inconceivable that there isn't a permanent director. Um, but that being said, you know, like I understand how difficult many of these challenges are. I just want to emphasize that my core concerns about phase two evaluation have nothing to do with whether the administration hires an executive director and sounds like it gets the program off the ground. It's got to fundamentally deal with the, uh, you know, the coordination of services the ability uh, of, of significant and strategic support for staff beyond an executive director occupying a seat um, and, you know, the engagement that the community stakeholders that we've got right now. So, you know, we will be paying close attention. Um, you know, we want to, this is a deep investment by our council. Uh, we cannot, we have already heard, as you know, from uh, the chair, one out of every three dollars is already spent on institutions that we have not gone further in. CCIP is the unknown part of it, the part that is outside of the traditional measures of dealing with violence that is not solving the issues. And so we want to know that it can it is uh, it has the kind of priority supports attention and a firm commitment to the outcomes that we desperately believe that we need to have. Otherwise, 
it won't be one out of three dollars. It'll be one out of two dollars. It'll be so much more and it's not giving us the outcomes that we need. So CCIP is something that, um, you know, that we need uh, a lot of attention to right now, because if we can't figure it out through CCIP and other cities have, to be clear, other cities have done this work. You can see the difference that it will make because that's the unknown area and that's why we're so attentive to it. So those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Gim, and thank you for the insight. Um, what I take from those uh, questions is that our evaluations, you, you, in addition to your own internal evaluation, you uh, let grants for how many different uh, organizations that are boots on the ground, quote? So the community expansion grants, um, we, uh, we awarded 31 grantees, about 29 made it through the program. So there are 29 different grants out there that we have to also evaluate, see how much they cost. It's, it's one thing to do good, it's also important to know how much doing good costs so that we can take programs that are doing good and bring them to scale. So if you're doing good in one area, but if you could replicate that in another, how do we do that? So that evaluation is a, a, a cost evaluation and a deliverables evaluation that we have to begin to do. I think we uh, invested one 145 million last time out uh for uh, 163 oh, um, across across uh agencies and, and across investments and there's going to be an expectation that we do that in a second round but each time we do that we should be making cost considerations of return on investment considerations to say that we like this program but does it does it meet what the outcomes we need? Did shootings go down? Did uh, crime go down? Did did murders go down? And to evaluate if we do more of this, will that trend continue? But it doesn't happen if we don't know how much things cost. So um, in your work, uh, we need to circle back and see how much did good cost us and yeah, to be able to, to to quantify that in our budget analysis going forward and councilman if i may um so a couple things one um with regards to our community crisis intervention program um if we uh don't put some level of consistent oversight on it what we need what we know is a priority um who then is is really paying attention to it and so um i i understand that folks have concern about positions but if there is not oversight then what um the second thing i will say in regard to our grants um we are a, we we have launched an evaluation at the same time we began our grants to be able to understand the importance of investing in community-based organizations that have the trust relationship and familiarity with communities because often um and the same the saint erica saying it's, it's it's something i've heard over the years it's um those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution but also have the least access to resources and power and so how do we change that paradigm so we can truly build an ecosystem around vulnerable communities that get out the short and the long-term issues they are experiencing including gun violence like quality education lack of support for behavioral health issues, lack of economic mobility, um, um, and just, just general quality of life issues. Okay, are there any other questions for Ms. Atwood? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And um, we will be doing the regular budget process, checking back in to be able to, to evaluate um, and then reappropriate and to reinvest. Uh, and to double down, if you would, on things that work, on things that work. Um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Glass, who's our next panelist to testify? Mr. Chairman, our second panel is Orrin Gurr, ADA Deborah Watson-Stokes, Melanie Nelson, and Gila Mar Stewart from the District Attorney's Office. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning still. 
Good, good morning. Good morning, Chairman. How are you, sir? You know, one day at a time. I'm, I'm so far so good. Uh, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you for having us again today. Uh, and good morning to uh, all of our colleagues uh, at City Council. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, several um, staff here at the DA's office to include uh, Assistant District Attorney Erica Rebstock, who is the Assistant Chief of the Homicide and non fatal Shootings Unit. Uh, joined also uh, by um, ADA uh, Deb Watson Stokes, who is senior advisor uh, on special projects as well as uh, professional development. We have with us Myra Maxwell, uh, at, who is our director of victim, our victim support division, as well as Melanie Nelson, who is the director of CARES. Uh, and ADA Mike Lee will be joining uh, as well um, uh, on the back end of this conversation. He and I will be. Uh, discussing a few points. Uh, well, that welcome said, to you all. Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, we should be through this presentation in about 18 or 19 minutes. Um, and so uh, Bria Ray Noor is sharing the slides today. And so Bria, if you can uh, start with slide number uh, three, which is the emotional toll on victims and survivors impacted by homicide. And uh, Melly Nelson will begin. Good morning. Thank you so much, Dean Lamar, Councilman Jones and committee. Thank you so much for having us today. It is truly a pleasure for me to be able to speak about the CARES unit. What is very unique about the CARES unit is that we are all peer crisis responders. That means that we have all experienced a homicide in our family or with a close loved one. That is so unique with us because we are deployed to crime scenes. And any of you who know me know I do not ask my staff to do anything that I would not do. All of the CARES responders, including myself, we are deployed to crime scenes throughout the city of Philadelphia from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. So we are providing crisis support to those mothers, to those fathers, the grandmothers, grandfathers, family members, cousins, neighbors, to anyone who was present on a crime scene in the city of Philadelphia, again, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. We are there giving them crisis support, giving them information on the medical examiner's office, giving them information on how they can make it through the very next day which is so traumatic. And while we're there speaking to these family members, their deceased loved one is still on the scene. The work that we do is extremely heavy. We're working hand in hand with the detectives that are on the scene. We're working hand in hand with the officers that are on the scene. The very next day, the lead responder from the CARES unit is calling all of those families, because sometimes we get those homicides that occur before 6 a.m. and after 10 p.m. But our lead responder is calling all of those families the very next day to let them know the services that we have available for them. And then we're going to do, after we're walking with them for 45 days, then we're going to do that soft handoff to the community based agency. That will then walk with them. But while we're walking with these families for these first 45 days, it's crucial. It is extremely crucial. A lot of these families, they do not have life insurance for their babies. So we're offering these, the funeral directors that we know where the money is not an issue. And they may wait to get their money off the back end when filing the claim through victim's compensation. We're, we're walking with them when they have to contact the medical examiner's office, because I don't know if you know, but the medical examiner's office procedure has changed since COVID. They cannot go down to the medical examiner's office and identify their loved one. They have to do that by phone. They may have to do that by email, which a lot of them think this, this is not empathetic. So we listen to them and we love on them. And we offer them the supports that are needed. We are speaking to these families when they can't get in contact with the homicide detective because they want to know what's going on with their 
their loved one. They want to know, has there been any updates in the case? And then they will contact us. So not only are we deployed to the crime scenes, we're also at the hospitals. We're at the hospitals when the, the families are gathered in that room and the doctor is giving that death notification at that time we're there to offer crisis support. So we are right there when the loved one finds out that their loved one is no longer with them in this life, which is very heavy work. But I will say that all of my responders, they love what they do. It's not a job. It's a passion for them. We're contacting them by phone. We're doing home visits. We're going out to their house to sit there and speak with them and again, love on them. Even during COVID, no interruption. We ask them, do you have a porch? Do you have a patio where we can sit down and we can speak with you and still offer those face-to-face -face needs that they have? So we do not miss a beat, even though we are in, in the COVID stage. We want to ensure that everyone gets what they need. And most importantly, we are providing the same services for every single co-homicide survivor, whether it makes the news or not. We provide the same services for everyone who is affected by a homicide. One of our greatest needs is relocation. For those mothers who have lost a loved one, maybe in her house, maybe in front of her door, but relocation is huge. So the CARES unit collaborates with the community-based agencies to ensure that all needs are met. And then of course, we lean on the other important units within the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office to ensure that safety is first and foremost for the co-homicide survivors. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, next we'll have uh, Reverend Myra Maxwell to talk more uh, in depth uh, regarding our relocation program. Next slide, please. Myra, are you there? I just need you to unmute. As you um, find your next person to testify, can you tell us in this process, the cost, uh, we wanna kind of focus, I, I, I know the good work I've been involved and many of our members on this committee have been there when those services are utilized and needed uh, at, a, at a crime scene, at a homicide, but also what, it, what does it cost to provide that? I, I, we want to drill down on, you know, uh, you know, there's an emotional cost, but there's actual cost involved too. So, so speak about the emotional cost, the beautiful part about what the community base offers, that all services are free. What CARES offers is free. And, and, and please forgive me, I forgot to mention therapy. Therapy is huge, but the CARES unit has a partnership with ABP and we're able to provide free therapy with them, which again, therapy is huge. A lot of the community-based agencies throughout the city of Philadelphia has a waiting list. And then sometimes you have those co-homicide survivors that may utilize therapy through their health insurance. I'm not sure about that cost, but the, the therapy cost they can be reimbursed through victims' compensation. So, the funeral costs, as you know, they can be reimbursed for up to sixty-five hundred. You and I know that's not enough to bury a loved one. We do have uh, some family members that have a janazah. That sixty-five hundred will cover that. But some other funerals, like, you know, the the funeral cost goes well over sixty-five hundred. So, so you touch on an interesting point of cost. So, a lot of people don't even calculate the fact that when someone dies, there's a funeral. And that um, when there's a crime scene, it has to be cleaned up. Um, and we, we had, in another hearing, talked about how much, God, to clean a crime scene actually costs. And we don't 
factor those things in uh, when, 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 we, when, when, when someone commits a crime, when someone dies, there is a cost to a funeral, there's a cost to that crime scene. And we want to create a model. Um, and I, I would only think that the controller's office would be utilized to be able to kind of keep track of these costs. And, and they're direct, some of them, and then they're indirect costs. Like you mentioned, the counseling. That counseling is free to people who are victims of crime, but someone at the end of the day has to pay for it. That's correct. That is and correct. And I will say this, Councilman, when you spoke about crime scene cleanup, through victims' compensation, they can be reimbursed for up to $500 for a crime scene. And the through PCCD, they've added a vehicle. Before, a vehicle wasn't included in those charges. It was just a home. But, but Councilman, the, the issue is reimbursement. People don't have that money up front to be reimbursed. The beautiful part about the, the CARES unit and our responders and how we work so hard, we try to find those resources for people who are not in it just for the money. We try to find those resources for people who are in it because they're empathetic, because they love people and they know that if we're working with this family, they will get their money on the back end. So we do have a resource for crime scene cleanup. So, I mean, I'm just trying to, so keep in mind in this hearing, but I'm not, you know, we're not evaluating what is good. We're, right. we're trying to evaluate how much good costs. And, and that's a, that's, I, what you do is priceless. Let me say that again. What you do to a grieving family for a grieving family is priceless, but there is a cost. And we have to kind of start in society figuring out what those costs are and, and how to reinvest more in, in certain aspects of it and kind of redirect in other aspects of it. And that's the hard part of this work. That's sure. the hard part of this work. Council so, member, we have uh, up next for Myra Maxwell, uh, who will talk a little bit about relocations. And I think this is an area, particularly around victim support, uh, that you and other council members have have raised many questions, and, and certainly there's a cost there. Uh, Mike Lee and I will kind of really hammer down on, on some of that later on, but uh, if, uh, if I could yield to Myra Maxwell, and then we'll go on to one other area, uh, because we have Erica Rebstock, who is on with us. She's currently in the courtroom right now, um, and going to do her presentation from the courtroom as our attorneys are working uh, uh, all morning trying to seek justice for, for victims of crime. Please proceed. Myra? Good morning, council members. Um, to, to speak a little bit about our relocation program, as you know, our, our relocation program has the two functions, which is listed. We relocate witnesses um, that are impacted by in intimidation. Uh, we actually are there to remove our families from any imminent or perceived danger, which means uh, imminent means threatened, intimidated by the perpetrator or their family members or others uh, that have something to do with the crime, but also perceived um, those who are may live in the same communities as the perpetrators or the families and are being intimidated or have a potential to be intimidated. Uh, the process, of course, we have to make sure that all of those families um, uh, file police reports because we work directly with our police department and we receive referrals from the police department as well as our prosecutors will refer to our, our program to make sure that their victims, witnesses, and the families are safe. It is very imperative because we have to make sure that we ensure their safety to the best of our ability because they are actually those who are testifying in many of our court cases against the perpetrators of crime. Uh, currently, uh, we receive approximately five or more um, referrals per week. So we are, our team is actually working both day and night. They are on the clock around the clock. They are working around the clock because when we get calls um, for immediate danger, then we have to act quickly to make sure that our families or our witnesses are moved out of the 
the, the danger zones uh, and making sure that they are taken to safety, which means that, of course, when we are removing families immediately, there are oftentimes families do not uh, may not have the ability to move in with another family member, which means that we have to provide hotel costs for them. With hotel costs, um, of course, if you have to provide more than one room because they may have multiple family members, uh, especially the children, we want to make sure our children are safe. Uh, we make sure that they are uh, there are more rooms if we need to get two maybe three rooms. Uh, we try to accommodate those things. Also, we have to make sure that we are not, uh, they're fed. They have to eat. People have to eat. So we're supporting, uh, making sure that they're able to eat. They may not have um, resources available where they're able to feed themselves while they're in uh, the relocation program. Um, the great thing about this program is that we do have staff that are there. They are available. And where they're moving, they're actually making certain that these families are receiving the same type of care that they will receive if they were actually in their own homes. So we are really supporting them uh, thoroughly. We know that the uh, current funding for the AG's office is approximately $1.2 million. However, Philadelphia being a large county, of course, we are really um, the ones that are using most of their budget. Uh, and then, of course, our city funding, which has been over time uh, $260,000 per year, and we are very grateful uh, for any additional funding that we have received to support this program. Of course, the cost, again, includes hotel, stays, parking, transportation to and from, especially if they have to go to and from court, and also to make sure that we are supporting them, of course, as the crime has upticked in Philadelphia, we have had increased referrals for relocation. Um, our funded support would also help, of course, additional fund funding support would help us to uh, include housing specialists to work alongside of those who are already serving and re relocating these families. Our housing specialists would then provide case management, which will assist with longer term support um, to stay for families to receive stabilized housing. So we do not want to have people that that are in our relocation program, unfortunately going out of the program and still are not able to sustain housing. They, we want to make sure that they have stabilized housing. So in order to, to do that, we would absolutely want to include case managers or housing specialists to assist with that process. We can never assume that families are able to um, navigate systems because we find that many of our families, unfortunately, are not educated. They don't have the capacity. Some of them may have um, maybe even a sixth grade education level. So we have to make sure that they're able to navigate these systems because they have other challenges. And we may have to also include uh, the, the fact that they are not able to go through the process without someone, so, someone some additional support, which is important. Again, we want to make sure that we are not um, now creating people that will become homeless later on and unfortunately have to return to the program. We want to make sure that they will have secure housing in the long term. So again, this is really important to all of us to make sure that these things are in place to support these families. And with that, of course, it comes costs. So with that, we hope to, uh, to increase and include services and supports in our relocation program, again, as the need is greater and the referrals are absolutely increasing. So let me interject real quick. At what level do we consider witness relocation? At, at what level in the continuum of crime does it warrant someone being relocated? Is it at a shooting? Is it at a homicide? Is it... It is all the above. We relocate folks for our non fatals as well as our um, other side co survivors. Uh, we certainly look out for, of course, the children um, because we have to re relocate families. So oftentimes there are a number of people. And it's even thinking about um, if the person who is a witness or a victim or survivor, um, sometimes they have family members that are elderly that they care for. So not only do we have to relocate the children, we also may have to relocate the elderly person in which. Uh, they are providing care for. So if there's any threat imposed, whether it's shooting, whether it's homicide, or whether it's other circumstances, we, we make sure that these families are well taken care of. It could be stabbings, it could be uh, other um, threats. But if there are threats of danger, we certainly want to make sure that they're relocated and getting them to safety. The only so, way that we won't, won't relocate a uh, council member is if they have maybe a murder conviction or if they are a sex offender. 
So I have to just say that sometimes we have to look into the background too, because sometimes there are people, not to say that it can't be done, but to say that if we have certain things, there are certain criteria that we have to adhere to through, of course, our attorney general's office. And we have more flexibility uh, with our DA funding as well. So we're able to do a little bit more. So, so, um, mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to get on the record is how much demand in a given fiscal year is there for witness relocation or relocation? Unfortunately, when I mentioned five per week, five referrals, and that's potentially five per week, for the most part, we are relocating the majority of these people um, to, to safety. Even if they're already in public housing, uh, we are actually helping them to get in other safe uh, safe areas uh, outside of the danger zone. So relocation is happening constantly. And most of the referrals, because they are coming from our police department, so we have documentation on the record um, that there is some form of intimidation occurring for that family. So last year, how many requests for relocation were there? Council member, I think that they're going to address that in what some of the other slides, if I'm, right, I'm correct. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. What, I, what, what I can share with you, council member, uh, as, as uh, my colleague, Reverend Maxwell mentioned, uh, we receive 260,000 annually from city council that comes through the managing director's office uh, to our office. Um, for uh, now, we did get an increase. Uh, DA Krasner made a request through our uh, finance unit. Uh, we asked, asked for additional funds. We received that um, in February, um, but we weren't able to, we, we requested it last, at the end of last year. We didn't receive it until February, and we weren't able to exhaust those funds because we had to use it by June. But I will share with you that for FY 2021, uh, out of the 260, we spent $259,717. Uh, so, so here's my question. In a given year, yes. how many people knock on the door and say, I need to be relocated? Yeah. Not how much you spent, because yeah. I know we didn't give you enough. Mm -hmm. Where is the demand? How, how many cases do we have that, that require relocation that we sometimes can't pay for. Certainly, we can get we can get those numbers and I'll, I'll ask uh, our victim support services division to provide those specific numbers as to how many uh, families we relocated as far as the number uh, over the last you know year, two or five years. Uh, we, we can get those specific numbers to you in, a, in an expeditious uh, fashion uh, because th again, that, that, that varies. One family, we may be relocating 20 people. One right. family. So yeah. So, so that's the get, kind of thing we yes. can quantify. Certainly. Uh, so we, we will get those uh, specific uh, numbers to you uh, uh, here in the uh, next uh, few days. And I will ask our, our victim support service division to begin to work on that. So um, what would be helpful? What would be helpful is if you said out of I know how much money we allocated. I know how much you spent. That's fine. Mm -hmm. How many people knocked on the door and said, Move me off of this block. And then what is the average cost of that move? Not in every case, but what is the average cost to provide that service to a victim or a witness? Understood. So we, we, yeah. We're going to put our arms around the true cost of this. And then the question I would have, how does that correlate to your closure rate? If I could move more people that want to be witnesses, they would be willing to testify on these cases that maybe we could get some justice. Yes. I, mean, I, I just did the request. All, all too yes. often in our budgeting, how much did I give you? How much did I spend? Mm -hmm. But not what the demand was, well, not what we should have allocated for you. Certainly, we'll them. get those. We'll get those numbers to you, uh, Council Member, uh, um, here in the next several days. Yes. Thank you. Um, just uh, last portion of our presentation, we have, uh, and if you can s skip slides, uh, Bria, let's go over to uh, our prosecution overview um, and ADA Erica Repstock, uh, who is Assistant Chief of the DAO's Homicide and Non-Fatal Shooting Unit, is is present. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes, state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Assistant District Attorney Erica Rebstock, and I uh, just thank you all uh, for your time today and for the introduction by G. Lamar Stewart. I am here in uh, the courthouse at the CJC in an ante room, so please, if you lose my connection, let me know and I'll turn off my camera. You're multitasking. Thank you. Yes, of course. So we have uh, we currently have 26 ADAs in our homicide non-fatal shooting unit. We prosecute all homicides and any case where a shooting victim was hit by a bullet for the DA's office. We will be going down to 25 ADAs as one of our attorneys is retiring in January of 2023. So that number of currently 26 going to 25 includes three supervisors, myself, uh, our chief of the unit, Joanne Pescator, and our second assistant chief, Bob Foster. So in terms of line DAs, where we're primarily assigning cases, that number is going to go currently from 23, excluding the supervisors, down to 22 as of January. And our current caseload is approximately 1,100 open cases. It's almost an even split, 550 homicides, 550 non-fatal shootings. And we are all on trial um, constantly. However, despite the ability to resolve some cases, we're trying them. Uh, we're actively, you know, working on pleas. We're resolving them. They're constantly coming in, new, new arrests and new charges. So those numbers are holding steady despite the fact that we're all currently on trial. Uh, I myself have a jury deliberating right now in a different courtroom, and so does uh, at least one of my other colleagues. So those are the numbers that we have. Um, and would also like the council members to consider that in addition to our cases, which which break down to about 50 to 60 cases per ADA, um, we have at all times two attorneys that are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that is to exclusively review warrants, search and arrest for homicides, and to review charges, uh, to potential charges, to decide to decline charges or what to charge for newly charged homicides. There's one on-call position that's exclusively for vehicular homicides, and that ADA works with the Accident Investigation Division. And then the other position rotates one week at a time, Friday at 5 p.m. until the next Friday at 5 p.m., where that attorney is on call for all other types of murder, and that is in addition to and not instead of their regular court load. So in other words, they're in court all day, they finish their, you know, their, their job at the office, they start on call, at five that Friday, they're on call throughout the weekend, 24 hours and throughout the week, 24 hours. And so that's another rotation that we have. It's not a separate position. It is absorbed by the current staff we have in our unit. So I guess what I'm looking for is a algebraic equation that says that if I have a shooting, the average shooting court time is X and it cost our department to do a plea. It usually costs this much to prosecute. And if it ends in a plea agreement, it costs this much. If I have to go to trial for a shooting or a murder case, the average time it takes to do that is Y and it's longer and it costs this much if that makes sense that i know how many cases you per ada have to do what i'd like a breakdown and not not today but i want you to think about how much does a murder case cost and i and somebody somebody has this number and i the reason i know is because when we start to do plea agreements there's a reason time and cost and, and 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 so that's why that that is the preferred outcome at times for a case let's plea it out and let's get it moved on but how much when somebody says no i want to go to trial how long does that average murder trial take and how much does it cost somebody has that number yes and i would uh, defer to G. Lamar and to our staff for the for the financial number. What I would ask for consideration of whenever we get that number and what it is, is that there's 
a difference that we have with a small subset of cases where a defendant wants to resolve the case quickly by play and that thereby the attorney is freed up because they're working on the plea negotiations early in the case and it's resolved and they can set it aside and, and move on to the next case versus a very much more common scenario we have, which is where the plea might take place the day of jury selection. So that attorney's worked on the case for a year and is prepared for it to go to trial um, or you know, the last week before, because the judge will do a final colloquy especially for our first degree murder cases, saying to the defendant, if you lose, it's a mandatory life sentence. Are you sure you don't want the offer you've been saying for the past 11 months you don't want? And I'll give you more time to talk to your attorney about it. And then they accept it. So just to keep that in mind as well as a distinction between quick, for lack of a better term, guilty pleas and ones that might take the same trial prep right up until the last minute. That, that is helpful. And here, here's why I say that. When um, I first took on the test of Criminal Justice Reform Committee, President Clark uh, gave me that assignment. They, the courts gave me, and you and your, uh, your department, the DAs, gave me a seven-page long possible outcomes. I, I, I never forgot that accordion style sheet of from the time of arrest to the time of a plea to the time of a sentence it just had seven different pages of possible outcomes but what it did not have was how much those off ramps at each juncture cost us if that makes sense that yeah. we don't know is it cheaper and i know it is if somebody takes that year and doesn't complete that trial, that has a different cost to it. And, and, and what I'm hoping to do, and the reason for these hearings, is to be able to create or charge someone to create a model that really truly tracks what it costs, not only internal departments like the Defenders Association, the district attorneys, the courts, but society. And it's a heck of an economic model, but is one worth doing so that we can better invest where we need to. I, I see you, G. Lamar, with that confused look on your face. But no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes, sir. That's all. I'm taking okay. notes. Okay. All right. Um, you, is that the end of your presentation? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to make myself available for, for any questions, but yes, I would just give a, a concluding remark, if I may, that our attorneys in our unit who are here and who have this heavy caseload, they are completely dedicated. Uh, they want to be here. They take pride in their work. They take pride in the, the quality of the prosecution. Uh, and with that, with that empathetic and compassionate relationship that they build with the families, with collaborating with law enforcement, um, and we're just hoping to retain them and to keep it competitive with other offers that may be coming in because the, the positive of the volume and the accelerated path, shall we say, is that in a shorter amount of time, you're gaining a lot more trial experience. So these attorneys who were in the units it, throughout our office in the trial division, and particularly in this unit, they are handling every type of case. They're making on-call decisions. They're making court decisions. They're trying every type of bench trial, jury trial pre-trial motions, post-trial motions, sentencings, and they're really valuable additions to the to the prosecution of these violent cases for the city. And so uh, we just appreciate uh, any consideration of all of the testimony that I've given today, and thank you very much for your time. Um, thank, thank you for your testimony, and thank you for taking the time to multitask while you're doing the people's business in the courtroom, you're also doing the people's business in city council hearings. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Mr. Glass? Mr. Chairman, at this time, there are no questions in, uh, in the chat. Thank you, G. Lamar. I think um, we don't have all the answers, but I think you've heard some of more of the questions that we need to think about. Um, and as we move towards um, our budget hearings, I really want us to kind of take into account 
how many I, I know what we we gave you money for for relocation but how much did that do to deal with the demand and if we could have given you more relocation money did that mean we would have had more witnesses that were available and would that meant that more trials would have been concluded with witnesses and and justice be done so one affects the other i i remember that there was a murder in north philly where the people the victim the perpetrator lived a block and a half from each other and they shared the same convenience store and when they looked out there their door, they could see down to that convenience store, and it was a cat and mouse game to try to avoid the people that they were going to have to testify against. That kind of situation often makes people reluctant to even get involved as a witness, to get involved as a as as a, a person who would have to testify against folk in the neighborhood and then have to come back to that same neighborhood to live. So these are important factors in justice. Certainly understood and uh, certainly agree with you, uh, count, uh, council member and Mr. Chairman, we'll get those numbers to you, particularly from our uh, victim support services division around relocations. Uh, I will have that to you and your team, hopefully by close of business this week. Um, and, and, and also the answer to the question how much does a plea to a shooting case cost versus a shooting case that goes to trial? Or the same for a murder case. And, and how long do they last and how much how much do they actually cost? Those kinds of quantifying cost centers allow us to know where we are and what your true budget needs to be. Good morning. Uh, Chairman. Understood. We have a uh, Mike, 88 Mike Lee uh, on. I think he wants to give a couple of remarks. Uh, I, I just wanted to respond to your last question, Council Member. Let's and state your name for the record, Mr. Uh, Lee. Good, good morning again. Mike Lee, Chief of Staff for the District Attorney's Office. And thank you for um, calling this very important hearing and including the District Attorney's Office as we try to work through this um, solution together. And to your last question about what would the difference be between a plea and a trial? Um, it's negligible because so much of the uh, fiscal cost is in the discovery and the analysis of evidence and um, witness preparation and things like that. So there would be some things like transportation costs or an expert testifying again as to what we already paid them to prepare in a report, but we'll gladly get that information to you. But um, I just wanted to uh, temper some of the expectation that there would be a tremendous amount of fiscal saving to a guilty plea. And that's why there's so much importance in our continued investment into uh, the caseload and the technology so that we can help better understand the cost of our decision making, both in terms of um, economics and uh, outcomes, in terms of uh, making sure we're actually helping people change their behavior, uh, but also in terms of our own performance measurements so that we know that what we're doing is measured and uh, right. So thank you again for the opportunity to allow us to speak. Um, and I just wanted to uh, touch very briefly on that particular cost piece. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. But in, in, in the holding costs of an individual that might take two years for a murder trial, that's a cost consideration. So let's look at it um, and we'll take a look at it and see what it what it truly costs. And I appreciate your cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Glass. Mr. Chairman, it does not appear that there are any questions in the chat. So uh, Keisha Hudson, Chief Defender of the Philadelphia Defender Association, will be our third panel. Thank you. Ms. Hudson. Good morning, uh, Council Member uh, Jones. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, Keisha Hudson. 
Please begin your testimony. Thank you for your patience. Keisha Hudson, Chief Defender at the Defender Association of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, on behalf of the staff um, and board of directors of the Defender Association, I want to thank the members of the City Council's Committee on Public Safety for inviting us to testify about the hidden costs of crime to Philadelphia residents. We know that there are some who have openly questioned uh, the value of public defenders' thoughts on gun violence and public safety, particularly as it relates to economic impact. But because we represent a majority of those accused of gun crimes in the city, we have a unique and invaluable perspective on the factors that lead some of our clients to take actions that unfortunately lead them to our office. And while we know the problem has impacted business and allocation of city resources, our office spends a great deal of time examining the direct economic impact on the residents of neighborhoods where our clients come from. I stated this previously, uh, but I think this is a data point that is so critical for this conversation and for our solutions here. Over 80% of our clients, over 80% of our clients accused of gun violent crimes are uh, victims of violent crimes themselves, are victims of violence. So right away, we need to dispel the notion that the current gun violence crisis is made up of static groups of victims and perpetrators. The reality is today's witness for the prosecution may well be tomorrow's defendant when it comes to gun crimes. In other words, nearly everyone is a victim of gun violence. We need to bear this in mind as we examine the economic consequences of this crisis. As you might expect, it is our position that our current carceral system of justice, with its emphasis on warrior policing and detention, has never and will never be the solution. In fact, if we're talking about economic impact, there's a mountain of research to suggest that these tactics are exacerbating economic destabilization in the communities where they are most often used. For decades in Philadelphia, traditional law enforcement practices and racialized mass incarceration has had a disproportionate negative impact on relatively small sections of the city, predominantly in poor black and brown communities. In communities vulnerable to violence, there are numerous factors that contribute to individuals becoming even more likely to participate in or be the victim of violence. These include disruption of the family unit, the city of Philadelphia currently leads the nation in the placement of black and brown children outside of the home. We lead the nation in that statistic. Economic and housing instability and school disengagement. Not only do these factors have the biggest impact on children, they have long-term consequences for them as individuals and members of the larger society. They're often both cause and consequences of incarceration. Even relatively brief periods of pretrial detention where presumptively innocent people are held prior to their trial have enormous impact on the clients we serve and their families. Per the court's research and data analysis funded by MacArthur Initiative, 30% of the jail population in September of 2022 were there pretrial. They had no detainers. They were there simply because they could not afford bail. Jail stays of three days or more, even if the charges are ultimately dismissed or the client is found not guilty, are linked to poorer life outcomes. The inability to secure pretrial release is linked to further entanglement with the legal system for up to two years after the initial arrest. This is because many of our clients are already living right at the brink of economic collapse. For example, the mass incarceration of men has contributed to an equally devastating eviction crisis. Families become unable to afford housing due to the loss of the incarcerated person's income. It leads one researcher to conclude that poor black men were locked up and poor black women were locked out. That's just one example. Criminal records That's where also I got place. that quote from. Now I know where I got the quote from. That's I attribute it to you now. Uh, that's just one example. Criminal records also place barriers between people and opportunities for employment and education, which puts them and their families in a nearly insurmountable economic disadvantage. Improving the fiscal outlooks for our most vulnerable neighborhoods will require us to completely rethink the role our justice system plays in the lives of those who come in contact with it. And while no single public entity or system can save our economy, Every stakeholder should reflect on their own practices 
to see what they can do to affect positive change. Shortly, the Defender Association will be sharing its own gun violence policy, where we outline some of the causes and conditions of violence. But we're also offering the result of our own internal analysis and ways to plan to improve our practice to better serve our clients and communities. These improvements include changes to our representation model to stay in better contact with our clients. I'm proud that just recently our Children and Youth Justice Unit has moved to vertical representation. Our youngest clients now have one attorney from the start to the end of their case. We want to embed victim services. We want to increase social service support in our office. I mentioned the earlier data about our clients who have themselves been victims of violence or trauma or have been removed from their family home at an early age and placed in foster care or who age out of the foster care system and, it, and have nowhere to go. These are the clients we see arrested and charged for adult crimes, including gun violence. So we want to provide more dedicated social service support. Our clients need wraparound services and as public defenders who sometimes spend a year there are two or three working on their case. If we can provide those dedicated wraparound social service report, uh, supports, our clients will do better. Many of our clients are going to come home. And so what will they come home to if we do not also work with the community to ensure that when they are released, we can minimize barriers to reentry? And I'm proud of the work that our staff currently does um, in getting into the communities uh, and working with the community partners, uh, communities where our clients live. Again, individual agencies acting alone won't stem the tide of violence. The justice system does have a role to play, but it was designed to address criminogenic behavior only after a crime has been committed. We can't expect to rely solely on law enforcement and our court system to break that cycle. The defender is committed to working with our justice system partners, community organizations, elected officials, citizens to holistically address the social and economic causes and impacts of gun violence on our city. Thank you again for this opportunity to share our thoughts and insights on this important issue. That concludes my testimony, council member. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for you and your department, your team's involvement in the 100 shooter review, which we uh, presented and your input in that regard um, showed how the continuum of um, criminal justice impact did by um, those individuals you defend. You, sh you, I mean, some of the things that came out of it that 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 we were able to glean that you saw young people as juveniles that you could have predicted and said with a little bit of uh, intervention, we could prevent them become, from becoming the adult defendant uh, in future cases. And that many times those individuals raised their hand and said, help, I need assistance. I have problems that are going to result in me being an offender. And we ignored them as a society. So I, I want to thank you for that. Um, and one of the things that your department also illustrates that if an individual, when, when, when an individual who is accused sits in jail, there is an economic cost. That's correct, Council Member. And, and your quote was that, give it to me again, I, I butchered it in the beginning of this statement. I'll but, just rem remind uh, Council um, about the data point that the 30 as of September 2022, 30% of the people currently in the Philadelphia prison system are there just um, on bail, and um, after three days, there's a poor um, uh, outcome um, because many of these people may have had employment. Um, they're often the ones who are paying the rent um, uh, to maintain housing. Um, they're often sometimes the only source of a family's economic uh, support. And after three days, those consequences start to mount. Um, and the, uh, the, the, it leads to an eviction crisis um, and the quote, and I quote it here, poor black men were locked up and poor black women were locked out. And that rippling effect of the economics of crime or the accusation of being accused of crime have wide reaching effects that it's difficult to model economically, but we need to kind of struggle with a model 
that shows when cause and effect uh, of things in our society and those reoccurring cost that, that, that we don't see often because that some of them are direct and some of them are indirect. And we really need to kind of use that in a way to say where we should invest, where we should place greater resources to prevent some of the negative outcomes. If, if you follow what we learned from you, that young people in uh, foster care have a disproportionate poor outcome, that they wind up without services, they wind up sometimes running afoul of the law, disproportionate to some of the young people that don't go through that system. If that is true, then if we invest a little more on the front end, we can save a lot more on the back end. So those kinds of budget decisions need to be made based on quantifying cost, short-term and long-term. And so that's the purpose of this hearing. Yes. And I wanted to thank you for what your department does. And people, listen, uh, Bill Greenlee, my former colleague, was a big fan, along with uh, Derek Green. Yes. And I remember us going over there, and we actually spent a day with your department. We had no idea, I had, let me take that back. I had no idea how much your department does from custody cases, being an advocate for those young people, being a public defender of the accused, to advocating for things like um, the removal of automatic life sentences for juvenile offenders. I mean, I can go on and on about what your department has done uh, with the limited amount of funding we give you. I'll say that again, with the limited amount of funding uh, we give you and the benefit that you give to all of us. And so I want to thank you for that. But uh, as we start to move towards budget, your department, the De Defenders Association of Courts, usually give us pretty good budget presentations. Yes, and we're we going do. to pay, yeah, you, you spend your time. I, 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 we'll come I with our, know, our data. We'll come with come our data, with data and our asks. And, and with your ask. But this year, I want to pay particular attention to what things cost. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we spend enough time on that so that we can truly appropriate to the need not just to the column in line, mm -hmm. but to the demand. And so if you'll, you know, I, I, I look forward, I literally, I, I'm, I've been, been here long enough to geek out on certain departments and I pay attention to their presentation and yours is one of them. Uh, Mr. Glass, are, is there anybody who has any questions for this witness? Mr. Chairman, there are no questions in the chat. So thank you for your testimony, and we'll be looking forward to those cost uh, analysis um, that your department so graphically provides every year. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you again for inviting us to uh, testify today, and we will be prepared this budget season um, with uh, the costs. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Mr. Glass, who's our next witness to testify? Mr. Chairman, our next panel will be Nick Hand from the Controller's Office. Are you connected? There he is. Good morning. How are you? Good afternoon. Is it morning still? It is still morning, yes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for um, providing testimony on behalf of the department. State your name and begin your testimony, please. Yes, of course. Um, my name is Nick Hand, uh, the Senior Director for the Finance Policy and Data Unit in the Office of the City Controller. Uh, once again, thank you for having me here today uh, to provide uh, you know, testimony about this important topic, the cost of crime uh, on Philadelphia mm -hmm. residents. In October 2019, the Controller's Office released a report on the impact of homicides on property values in the city of Philadelphia. 
Uh, in, in 2018, Philadelphia had the highest per capita homicide rate of any of the top 10 largest cities and was on track to match or sur surpass 2018's total again in 2019. At the time, Philadelphia's homicide rate was increasing while other large cities were seeing drastic declines. And it's important to note, as, as, we've, uh, as the report does and as we've discussed today, the vast majority of homicides in Philadelphia are committed using a gun. And the population most affected uh, by this gun violence in Philadelphia is, is young black men. And as the financial watchdog for the city, the controller's office wanted to examine the impact of homicides and gun violence through a financial lens. The, the report did not seek to quantify the, the human impact of a murder, um, which is, is difficult to quantify, but instead focused on property values in the city. It, uh, the report chose to examine housing values as an update to a, a 2012 center, uh, study by the Center for American Progress that looked at uh, the, the cost of reducing violent crime. And that study identified lost property tax revenue as the single largest source of potential savings for mun municipalities if violent crime levels were reduced. Uh, the, the, the controller's office study analyzed all homicides, so more than 4,100 homicides and more than 220,000 residential sales, uh, residential property sales that occurred in Philadelphia between the years of 2006 and 2018. And by analyzing ho homicides and sales that occurred nearby to each other and also within a, a short time frame of each other, the analysis was able to use a statistical model to isolate the effect of homicide on housing prices in their immediate neighborhood of the homicide. And the analysis found that homicides have a, a sizable effect on nearby sale, sale prices. Uh, each homicide lowers the sale price of a home by about 2.3% in the immediate neighborhood. Therefore, you know, a, a reduction of one homicide would then be associated with a corresponding 2.3% increase in sale prices. And at the time the analysis was conducted, uh, when the city was experiencing about 350 homicides annually, the report found that reducing homicides by 10% would, re would result in an increase of about $13 million, $13 million in property tax revenue for the city uh, in one year. And if the number of homicides were decreased 10% annually for five years, the effect on the housing prices would compound, leading to a net increase in property tax revenue of $114 million. Uh, additionally, our report highlighted the, the secondary economic effects um, of reducing homicides, including reducing economic divestment in areas experiencing higher levels of gun violence, job losses, depopulation in the most dis disadvantaged neighborhoods in the city, uh, all of which have an effect and an impact on Philadelphia's tax base. Uh, to support our analysis, the controller's office sought input and review from experts in, in violence reduction uh, and statistical modeling. Our, our full report, uh, as well as the, the data and software that was used in the analysis, is available on our website. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, this concludes my testimony and happy to address any questions. So this is uh, meant as a term of endearment. You are the geeks that I seek. And the reason I say that is because I think your department is most able to do modelings that can kind of, a lot of these departments are so busy doing the day-to-day -day work that they cannot take the time to analyze the data to show the impacts that aren't directly associated with their department. So. There was a, a scene in a series called The Wire where crime was allowed to happen in an area that they wanted to gentrify and take over and, and you know, move, move poor people out of and that the property values went down so low um, that developers, speculators were able to buy it. Well, what your report kind of shows that um, fiction is, 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 is stranger than fact in the sense that there is a direct correlation between where someone wants to live and the violence rate in that neighborhood. Uh, and and, and I, I think that 
is what your 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 um, data showed. Is that right? That is right. Yes, and I'm I'm familiar with that scene, and that's that's correct. The other thing that I would say um, that the gun violence and violence and crime in the inner city has risen to the point where the business community is paying attention. And they're paying attention because it impacts tourism. It impacts, I remember a senator friend of mine said that there was a Villanova game that one of his senators from out west wanted to go, but they weren't familiar with Philadelphia and the suburbs and said, I don't want to go to the Villanova game because of the violence in Philadelphia. Well, if you know Philadelphia, you know Villanova is is detached a bit uh, and you're not going to run into some of the day to day problems that Philadelphians might face in Villanova. But if you're from another part of the state, another part of the country, when you read the headlines, when you see the statistics, you might not want to go uh, to inner city Philadelphia for your family reunion or your your different um, uh, retreats that you might have with your colleagues in, in a medical field because of the stereotype of what public safety is based on that. And it has an economic impact on our city. So what I'm asking is, is there a way that the controller's office can expand that modeling to take into account some of the rippling effects economically of crime uh, and, and the cost of it, both direct and indirect cost of crime. Is there, is, could there be a model developed uh, to kind of track it a little better? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's um, something that we would have to look into uh, a little bit more. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons we looked at property values is because it was one of the most concrete effects um, of crime uh, in terms of things you can measure, right? Um, and we we noted, you know, there as as you said, there are a number of other secondary effects, disinvestment, uh, job, you know, economic impacts. Um, so it would be some. It would it it would require some uh, additional discussion on our end to to see if that's something that would be feasible. It's um, so when you think about what was testified today, that we don't truly have a sense of what a homicide case costs. Mm -hmm. We should know that. Mm -hmm. um, and on average, and you know, mean, median, and mode, how much does it cost when that kid pulls that trigger? What does that rippling effect do? If we look at visitation and how many, you know, conventions we may get or may not get based on the perception of Philadelphia's crime situation, we need to start monitoring that cost. Uh, and so we could go on and on uh, as to the lost wages uh, and, and things like that, that we can actually tangibly track and begin to put a price tag on. And I don't want to do it to shame any of us to point fingers at any of us, but to point towards investments, budgets that we should make investments in that says, all right, um, this seems to work, but it's, you know, I mean, when we start talking about Mr. Atwood's testimony and the 50 or so boots on the ground organizations, somebody has to draw up a model where it says that we put a million dollars into this zip code. A million dollars worth of resources. Crime went down exponentially because of that investment. Let's make more of that investment. We put a million dollars over here in something else, and it didn't work. So we need to adjust our budget investment because of it. If it, and again, I, I used broken English, if it ain't measured, it ain't managed. And we can't keep throwing money at things without measuring it 
so that we know what the return on our investment is. I, no, so I, yeah. you are the geeks that we seek. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and I, you know, I think one of the other takeaways from the report was that um, with this sort of preventive uh, investment that that you would make, you know, in terms of violence reduction, the because of the wide reaching effects and impact that, that these these things, these programs should should pay for themselves uh, and they should you know have a reinforcing uh, effect where you're able to lower lower violence, uh, but also do it in a way where there's a, a strong return on investment financially if you're just looking at the financials. Um, so, so think about what you just think about what you just said. If I reduce crime from 20 homicides in a zip code and a homicide case costs X amount of dollars, that's a savings that can be reinvested into that program. And there is then cause and effect. And I think we need to, we really need to look at the science of what we're doing as well as the um, emotional investment in what we do. And I, and I, I put it this way, we want to do good, but we al always must know how much doing good cost. And that's where you guys come in. Are there any questions from other members of this committee? Mr. Chairman, there are no questions in the chat. So thank you for your testimony and stay tuned. I'm going to really set up a time to meet with you guys to talk about a model that can track what the true cost of crime and the, the reduction of violence can mean to our city. Great. Look, looking forward to it. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. You. Mr. Glass. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our panel for this meeting today. The only thing we have left is public comment. Who do we have in public comment? Our first speaker for public comment is Judith Robinson. Ms. Robinson, are you there? Are you connected? Ms. Robinson? Who's our next person to, t to testify on public comment? She was our only testifier. I believe Modesto said he was connecting her. If she is not here, then that Good is- Good morning. Hi, Ms. Robinson. Good morning. Thank you so much for your patience. Yes. Would you like to begin your testimony? Yes. St state your name and begin your testimony. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Queen, Queen Judith Robinson here to testify on at the Committee of uh, Public Safety on uh, 220884. Uh, wow. The true cost of crime. I want to state these uh, statistics that I just got this morning. And um, I'm not sure if uh, Councilman Isaiah Thomas is on this committee. Yes, he is. But, all right. So when I ask her for statistics, um, I know what I would be asking for and what I would find. So sending me what uh, Councilman Jones and uh, Samantha Williams and others did such a herculean job on the uh, last 100 crimes is different than the violent crimes at service stations. And this is recent history. So last year we know we had 562 homicides. And I'm going to say this as a grandmother, mostly black people, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not happy at all. So there's no way you can count the amount of trauma and impact to just one person, okay? You couldn't even calculate it for me. But I'm going to try to be cogent and calm and respectful. So carjackings has quadrupled, okay, in 2022. 69 gunpoint robberies in 2022. 
17 non-fatal shooting victims, and this has really increased tremendously since 2018. Um, so when we talk about impact, you know, which ways, uh, how much impact are we talking about? Um, who and what? That's just at service stations, okay? So I want to say um, the bill regarding driving issues, and I, I'm, I stopped uh, calculating all the numbers in my head, so you all figured out. You got more staff to help you know what I'm talking about. That driving while black or whatever it's called um, should be repealed, okay, so we could get some of this mess under control. So... There's no, you don't have a calculator big enough to um, calculate the impact, the psychological warfare. Our seniors, and I don't know if they're telling you all this, but I'm here to tell you, are afraid to go out in the daytime, afraid to be out in open spaces. You know, they're claiming crimes that didn't happen yet. So that's like in their heads, based on the conditions in our community. I was at a forum on Saturday about tourism. How are we going to invite people to our city? 2023 or 2026? Murder and mayhem all around. Come on. So, solutions, because I like to be solution-oriented. Let's start with firearms, tracing them. How are they getting in the hands of our children? Um, I saw the uh, report about a former deputy sheriff I know mean, you've all been pretty quiet about that. You know, when I say trace the firearms, that's what we were talking about. And they were able to trace them right away because of what happened in Roxborough at Roxborough High. Unfortunate situation. We can't allow these things to fester and then things like that happen. So let's start with our children. That's already an illegal. We don't have to create another law. Not one other law to get a firearm. Who's responsible for that? ATF, FBI, whoever. You know, people keep asking about the National Guard. They only protect property. Let's get to the bottom of it. Who is responsible for firearms and children? Children, okay? Because that's what we're working with here. Anyone under 18 is already the law in Pennsylvania. So let's not, you know, change the professional licensing laws, but you all can't get to the laws that's already on the books. I see some racism in crime fighting. Because if children of another persuasion, color, were running around with firearms, something would be done immediately. And we know that. So let's do something about it. I'm up here in the 22nd District. Please, can I get some of you at-large people's attention up here to what's going on in this 22nd District? Meetings here, meetings there, new captain, blah, blah, blah. But we still are mixed up in between. You know, it's a lot going on. We need some of your attention up here to help our council president out, figure this out, since we can't seem to figure things out, you know. We got pile senders up here. We want them all programmed. You know, I, you know what I even want? There's some radicals. Some, let, let me go with the sovereign, the, the, the uh, policing, detectives. We need more detectives, more crime fighters, more uh, cyber intelligence, um, all of that. I am saying all of that because we have a lot of opportunities here in uh, North Philly. I'm near Temple University. We're near Hahnemann Center. We got all these centers and spaces where we could coordinate programming. Every um, bid, Opportunity Zone, et cetera, PHA, uh, all this money could be directed in prevention, okay? Very much opportunities here. So once we have all these opportunities, which we can expand even more, Temple University, all the rest of them, giving out all kinds of opportunities to get your diploma from top to bottom, training of all kinds, then we want the police to do their jobs, the DA to do their jobs, the uh, everybody, all the folks grabbing dollars, do your job. Let's see some improvement. I'm even going to come up with something real radical because a lot of these crimes are economics. You all are giving away so much money, just spending money like you don't understand penny pension, you know, like we all were rich or something. You know, we could just blow a million dollars here and there and get no, no return on investment. Um, so since these crimes are mostly economics, why don't you all take a million dollars, find these criminals, and give them direct cash? 
maybe that will slow them down. You know, have that any, anybody ever come up with that idea? If so, let me know more about it. Maybe we can all put our heads together and see how we could do this. Because if we're squandering millions of dollars over all this period of time, since I go all the way back paying even attention to the money, since a blueprint for a safer Philadelphia, that's billions now, billions off the head of a child that we said it would never happen again. And here we are now, fast forward to the future, billions later, with children with firearms. People scared of a little bit children. Teenagers running around with massive firearms, and we need to know what the hell is going on. Trace them firearms. Find out who's giving children firearms. Let's see. Let's see. Put the names up. We got one so far. I'm sure that's not the only one. Let's find out what's going on. Allegedly. Oops, Lee. Allegedly. But they got them red-handed. So, you know, what, what are we talking about here? So, look, let's talk about how these guns are getting in the hands of these children. Let's talk about economics. Every bid, Broad Street bid, every TIF, every PHA shovel-ready project, every opportunity zone is a chance to include black people. Black youth, train them, work their behinds, and they'll go home and rest instead of giving them a gun, having them shoot up our neighborhood and having our seniors afraid. There's no way you all can calculate that impact. We're in a psychological warfare trauma. Get it together. You all got the power or get out the way. Otherwise, y'all scary. If you all would sit down there in them seats and keep seeing this mess going on, and maybe some of you know of a better ex of, uh, solution, and you're not making it happen, or moving out the way and let somebody else get it done. Because it's, it's this black problem here. Mostly black people killing each other with illegal guns given to them by some nefarious situation. That's my testimony for today. Thank you all very much for hearing me out. Thank you for your testimony and insight. The, um, there was a quote that said, the best solution for gun violence is a job. And it's to your point of, um, you know, trying to get the offenders to, to figure a better way uh, to provide for themselves and maybe create an incentive for them not to be uh, so engaged in the street life it is a job, it's something we should take a harder look at. And thank you for your testimony. Mr. Glass. Mr. Chairman, we have no one else for public comment today. So this concludes the business Mr. of Mr. the- Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Thomas, Thomas. Uh, Member Thomas, yeah. how are you? Yeah. Yeah. Did you I, want to uh, comment? Something. Yep, I just did put it in the chat feed. Teacher, I apologize. I first wanted to thank you for your leadership on this issue and thank you to all the panels who came and testified this morning. I think we got some more valuable information as it relates to the fiscal side of the violence problem that we're facing in the city of Philadelphia and working with you and other members of council. We've been trying to tackle this and, um, you know, while we may, you know, be putting forth maximum effort, we still know we have work to do as it relates to addressing a crime in the city of Philadelphia. But I did want to just take a moment to talk a, a brief second about the driving equality legislation, just to be able to provide some clarity real quick before we are hearing today. Um, the first thing is uh, around carjackings. Uh, so you and I actually were together uh, last week when we uh, met with some folks who talked to us a little bit around issues with carjackings here in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, the the I don't want to go in depth because the information wasn't the best news, but we were able to hear why we uh, see so many repeat offenders as it relates to some of the carjacking issues that we have in the city of Philadelphia. Um, outside of that, uh, just for clarity purposes, while driving equality was um, essentially passed in 2021, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that driving equality wasn't implemented into law until. 2022. So uh, similar to what the witness who talked about driving equality testified about, we've seen uh, a huge spike in carjackings uh, in the city of Philadelphia, but that spike started prior to the implementation of driving equality. Um, I also wanted to make sure that we were clear for the record that um, stolen cars can still be pulled over. 
uh, tenant window cars can still be pulled over. Uh, people who commit motor vehicle code violations that are a public safety hazard, like speeding or running a stop sign or turning the wrong way or anything else that could put people in a position where it could create a certain danger, um, those cars can be pulled over. Um, we agree that there are more guns in the hands of children than what we've ever seen. And when you look at the impact that the internet and social media is having on our young people, especially after being home for a couple of years, when you look at this idea of ghost guns and think about what it means now, not just to be able to get access to a gun easily, but to get access to a gun that's untraceable, it's completely changed the issue of crime and criminal justice as it relates to the circumstances that we're dealing with. So at the end of the day, one of the things I always say is we can't use 1990 solutions to solve 2022 problems. And at the end of the day, if we all agree that we have more children involved in this stuff than what we've ever seen in recent history, I don't know why we feel like pulling more people over will pull us in a position to be able to address these crimes. We listen to the problems as it relates to cameras. Uh, we listen to issues as it relates to the courts. We listen to issues as it relates to enforcement. We know that we have a gamut of problems as it relates to the crime that we have in the city of Philadelphia. And today we got a better look and a better lens at the cost and the fiscal side of it. So the work continues. Um, I know we're all passionate and concerned about the issues that we're facing, but I just don't want us to uh, take steps backward and create some ill-advised consequences uh, because we're passionate about what we're going through right now. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you. I appreciate your leadership. And I look forward to continuing to work with you and my colleagues to do the best that we can to address the crime in the city of Philadelphia. So Member Thomas, I appreciate your comments just now. And I want to say for the record that I watch how you equally say that we want to do crime prevention, but we not at the expense of criminal justice reform. And to be, be able to create that balance so that there is a, a fairness to it. Um, I appreciate your effort. Um, every time when we get a little piece of information that we add um, to our repertoire of solutions, like the, the meeting that we won't talk about in this hearing, where we in depth learn some things about the carjacking situation in Philadelphia and the fact that some of the offenders are getting younger and more violent, also has a ripple effect to the fact that poverty is a part of it, that some of these young people live in the cars that they're carjacking. That some of these people that are doing the offenses have not been given um, certain opportunities. They live in that car, they go and get a white t-shirt, change their clothes, and that's how they live their day. So you cannot look at the cause without looking at the effect, look at the effect without looking at the cause. And we're going to continue to work. And we have to quantify what the results are to see how much things and doing good and how much doing good costs. And because we have to make some serious decisions in the next fiscal budget about things we want to expand and things that we need to alter to, to create capacity to do things that are effective. And that's the work. That's the work that we have. And I look forward to doing it with you and the members of this committee. Are there any other people to testify Mr. Glass. Mr. Chairman, there's no one else in the chat who wishes to be recognized. So that concludes the work of the Public Safety Committee for today, dealing with um, resolution number, what's that, 220884. Was that it? Mr. Glass? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, thank you uh, for all those who came to testify today. We appreciate you. Ms. Brooks, uh, Member Brooks, did you want to please? No, I don't have any comments. Thank you so much for this hearing. Well, thank you for listening, taking the time. All right. Thank you, and everybody have a good day and be safe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues.